Now a very good morning or afternoon to all who has joined us. Amazing. Seems like we had a lot of people who are already waiting. Um, right now I can see that our numbers have just shot up all of a sudden. I think we have 63 people in here so far, 67, 70. Wow. Firstly, thanks so much everybody for joining. Really appreciate you guys for joining as well. My name is Asher and I will be your webinar host for our Supermetrics first ever APEC specific webinar. Okay, and of course, we have Mao here, who has joined us as the panelist. Uh, Mao will have some time to introduce himself later. Great. So, I see that we are close to 80 people so far. It seems like the numbers are still increasing. Can I just ask, you know, if you can type in the chat box, tell us which country you are from, because APEC is such a big country. We've got people from Southeast Asia, ANZ. Yeah, if you can just tell us where you're from, that would be uh, really great. Yep, Sisakis, thanks for making this easy to attend. Yes, Australia. We, Mom, we've got lots of people from Australia. We've got three so far, four so far from Australia. Wow. Brisbane, we've got Indonesia, Singapore. Yes, our headquarters. All right. So, of course, for Indonesia, you know, if you're from Indonesia, of course, I've got to say to you, Salam Pagi. Good morning to you from Thailand. Right, so I want to crop to you. We've got someone from the US all the way from the other side of the world. Thanks so much for joining in. Someone from the Philippines. All right, Kamusta to you. All right, from people in Philippines. Hey, Mao, just quick, quick question. You know, you've traveled around APEC, right? Which countries, I guess, out of Australia have you been to? Outside of Australia, uh, Singapore, China, Indonesia, Thailand, US, UK most of Western Europe, um, nice. New Zealand. Yeah, done, done, done quite a bit of traveling. I, actually, I was actually born in Singapore. Oh. So, and, and, and good day oh, to Gavin, um, who's who's on the webinar. Good to, good to see you here. I, I'm recognizing quite a lot of the names, so it's fantastic. Yeah, probably came came because of, of you as well. <laughs> Viet, Vietnam as well. Xin oh, Chao to you, if you're from Vietnam and all that. Okay, now we just maybe give it about one minute for the rest of the people to come uh, because we still want to start uh, pretty much on time so we can respect uh, all of you who came early and we really appreciate all of it. Okay, so we just give it a bit more time. But Mao, I mean, if, if you were to choose a country in APEC outside of Australia that you really like, you really love to visit, right? I, I'm curious, which one would it be actually? I would go to Singapore. Like Singapore is, it's it's still home in many respects. I go back there and it feels like, it feels like Australia is, is home and feels like home. But I go back to Singapore and instantly like the culture, the food, um, everything. I just feel very settled there straight away. Um, and I guess Bali as well. Like I, I love Bali for a holiday. So, <laughs> I mean, that is us. We are, we are known for our food, particularly in Asia. Actually, in every part of, of Asia, actually, food is always- Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Asian street food is the best. But no one makes chicken rice like in Singapore. You got that right. At least that's what I can do. <laughs> From a Singaporean myself, I'm I'm very biased, but yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it just doesn't taste the same. Like outside of Singapore, it just doesn't taste the same. Like it's, it's still delicious. It's chicken rice. You can't go wrong. But in Singapore, it just tastes that extra little bit better. Yeah, where we have our neighbors, uh, um, you know, our neighbors here who would love to introduce you to some great food as well in the future. Well, I'm going to be over there in October. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. But with that being said, okay, it seems like it's 11.04. Let's get started, shall we? You know, we want to, again, respect those who uh, came early. But once again, to all those who have joined us, a very good morning or afternoon to all of our friends joining all across APEC. My name is Asher and I will be your webinar host for today. Now, firstly, I want to say that I'm really excited to see all of you join us for today's webinar because we're going to chat about two things. Firstly, generative AI. And secondly, how it can be used to analyze and act on your marketing data. Now, more importantly, I'm really pumped to be able to ask our amazing guest now some questions later on and really drew into his mind because even when we had a chat before this, he was really sharing with us some topics and we were really amazed at his depth of knowledge in that area. Now, but before we introduce Mao, just want to run through some housekeeping rules as well as instructions for all of you here. So let's jump into the slide there. Oops, went a little bit further. Now, I just want to say there's just three main things to take note of during this webinar. Firstly, as you can see on the screen, the webinar will be recorded and sent to you after the event. So we know that some of our colleagues can't join or maybe 
there are people who registered but they can't join. So rest assured, we'll be sending this recording to you. Number two, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end. So in the meantime, during the webinar, if you have questions, feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box. And lastly, we will just have a survey after the webinar where we just talk a little bit about you know, understanding how you feel about the webinar as well as if you are interested to find out more about what Mao do or what Supermetrics does. Now, in regards to the format of the webinar today, it's fairly straightforward. We will introduce Mao and Supermetrics later on. We will just run through a couple of questions regarding data as well as generative AI and how Mao utilizes it on a day-to-day -day basis to make marketing decisions or strategies. And we will also be sharing a few resources that Mao has prepared. So it's a little bit more visual so you can all follow along as well. So with that being said, the initial instructions are done. We want to first better understand our audience first before we go to Mao. So we actually have our first question for you. Just help us understand and fill in the poll right now and tell us if you're an existing customer of Metrics today. That's our only us. Okay, are you a current? user of Supermetrics. I will just give it some time. Right. Mao, on this point, I'm just really curious, how, how long have you been a customer of Supermetrics? Because you've been with us for quite some time, right? A long time. Uh, I would say 2017 or 2018, one of the one of the two, I can't actually remember which. So it's been a while since I've uh, since I first discovered Supermetrics. And since then, it's it's been part of my toolkit. It's been like one of the top things in my toolkit. Um, in every role which I've held since then, it's probably like the second or third thing which I implement um, because otherwise I have no visibility. I feel, I, I actually feel a little bit blind and lost. Um, also because I, I think part of it is like, I'm fundamentally lazy. So I don't want to go into each different platform and extract data. So it's like, man, if this is going to save me like that time of going in, exporting a CSV, uploading it into, into, a, into a spreadsheet somewhere, I need this in my life. Yep. And we really appreciate the kind words, right? You've pretty much been a customer <laughs> even before we, we had an office over here. But I mean, just from the poll, I can see it's about a 50-50. Um, and of course, for those of you who may be new, like what uh, Mao said, really, we, we simply provide a seamless way for you to consolidate all your data from places like Google, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, into places like Google Sheets, Luca Studio, Power BI, or maybe even data warehouses like BigQuery, just like what Mao said. Um, essentially, we are trying to help to help marketers get more of their marketing budget through greater data-driven insights. Mm. So as we mentioned, we were originally based out of Finland, beautiful country, but now we have offices in US, parts of Europe, and more importantly, we are also now present in Singapore as well as Australia. So we are much closer to all of you now for our customers in APEC. So let's get started right now with an introduction of our honored guest of the day. Now, before I pass the mic to Mao, I just want to say that Mao is a highly respected e-commerce advisor. He's the CMO and managing director of Ecom Nation. Now he has a successful track record as the former head of marketing at really big companies like Uber, as well as the CMO at RiderWay. So he really brings extensive experience in the growing uh, global brands. So Mao, why don't you give us a quick hello to our audience here today and maybe tell us more about the exciting things that you do as an MD at Ecom Nation. I'll pass yeah. the mic to you. Great. Thanks, Asha. Uh, I've, I've been working in the digital and tech space for about 20 years now. Um, and during that time, you know, I've, I've managed to, you know, to, to explore all the different technologies which have happened since then, since I first started building websites back when I was like 16 years old. Um, but now, you know, a lot of my focus is, is on e-com nation and advising a large number of clients. So at e-com nation, we are a specialist e-commerce marketing agency, which does strategic advisory through to growth operations. So performance media, Shopify development and, and CRM and loyalty. Um, and we work with a wide range of clients um, in the e-commerce space and helping them grow. Um, but before that, obviously when my background has always been in the retail on um you know, on retail and tech space um, has really formed a key part of me my first retail job was back when i was um when i left when i left high school i started working in retail actually matter of fact my very first job was working at a supermarket so in a way I've, I've been in retail since my since my early early teens um but some of what i do now is really helping the brands we work with unlock growth within the business um, to either help them achieve whatever their objectives are. So if they're trying to get from, if they're a startup trying to make their first million dollars or a business turning over a million dollars, trying to get to from six figures to seven figures, seven figures to eight figures, really helping them understand what is it, what is it which is blocking their growth. Um, and for me, a lot of that starts with data and really understanding 
understanding what how do we diagnose the symptoms and the way i look at it is that a lot of my job is as is as a doctor or a diagnostician of 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 marketing or, or of growth where clients ceos whoever it is typically are reporting a symptom and the symptom is we don't have enough revenue we don't have enough leads we don't have enough xyz that's the symptom my job as the CMO um, or as a marketer is to diagnose what it is which is causing that symptom and then 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 understanding, then recommending the right treatment to be able to treat that symptom in order yep. for us to be able to cure that. Yeah, so a lot of us start with, with revenue. My job is to dig beneath that, to dig what's actually happened, to dig underneath that, to figure out what's happening with the data, um, to point me in the right direction so that I can recommend the right course of action for us to be able to get this business back on track, whether it's unblocking growth um, or whether it's you know improving profitability, um, whatever it is. And that's something which I've done quite frequently throughout my career. Obviously, at, at Uber, we had quite dramatic growth. Um, and I was very fortunate to be at Uber in 2014 when Uber first launched, um, part of the part of the early launch team um, in, in Australia, um, and also got a taste of what it really means to be in a data-driven organization where everything is data. Every single thing which you do has a direct impact on key business metrics. Yeah, and, and to be able to see that impact in real time was was really exciting. And while I had previously worked in digital marketing before, I never quite was able to see it quite like that. So when I left Uber, then moving into RightAware and an e-commerce brand where you've got all this data at your fingertips, you're in the same position where you can see the immediate impact. You can see the correlation between an organic social post, which went viral, and search volume, and then web traffic, and then purchases. You can really see that in real time. And I gotta say, supermetrics is a big part of actually unblocking that and re really taking the blinkers off. You know, me as a marketer, mm -hmm. when I left Uber to, to give me those superpowers, I guess to be able to see all the data and start joining the dots to figure out what it is we needed to do. Yeah. And and I think the beautiful thing about when you talk about revenue, right? I think that's really the beautiful part of things, especially when, you know, in this day and age yes marketers jobs is amazing but really at the end of the day is to contribute to revenue and i think for especially for someone like you who deal with e-commerce brands yes you can run the campaigns and all but at the end of the day you're accountable to your clients to say so how much sales are you generating me through these campaigns so i think that's the beautiful part right where you really combine this sort of data together and see the relationship between revenue or sales and your marketing efforts mm. and of course speaking of uh, all of these marketing efforts as well as uh, the amazing things that Mao does. Now, if you are interested, uh, Mao's uh, company, Ecom Nation, they actually have a podcast named This Week in E-Commerce, where Mao describes it as an exclusive ticket to the latest news and trends shaping the e-commerce landscape. So uh, feel free to share more about it. We will have links uh, at the end of this webinar. But with that being said, let's get started, right? Since pretty much Mao, you have went into the data part of things. Now, you have extensive experience both on the brand as well as the agency side of things. Now, we have a couple of questions to you, but to ensure that we know uh, what are the type of audience he's speaking to today, we actually want our audience to answer the second poll and simply tell us if you are representing a brand or an agency today. Hey, are you today representing a brand or an agency? Because depending on where you are, that will help Mao better understand you know, what type of audience he's speaking to today. So again, a simple question, are you representing a brand or an agency today? And I thought I'll share as well uh, the interesting part uh, here at Sometrics is that we always like to tell our customers, I believe 40 to 50% of our customers are agencies. Uh, so we really love to talk to both kind of uh, marketers as well as analysts, data people on both sides of the equation. Marketing as well as brand or in-house. Right, and I've let's both. see. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Slightly more okay. in the agency space, 55% and 45%. All right. So, Mao, well, you know your audience now. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, that, that helps you to you know, uh, decide you know, where you want to go in regards to the questions and answers. Now, okay. So, let's go with the first question. Um, you know, of course, we want to talk about AI, generative AI, but mm -hmm. we can't do that without first talking about data right now because... Yep. All the AI models out there have to be trained by data. They have to be trained more specifically by the right data. So Mark, help us kick things off, right? I mean, you talk about your useful metrics and all that to bring data, things like that. But tell us about your relationship with data in general. How do you utilize it in your day-to-day? -day? And, and you know, tell us even a little bit more about the revelation, that they, how data is powerful and things like that. Tell us more about that just in general. Look, I think... <laughs> 
to answer that, I, I need to go way back to, 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 to where I first started in, in the marketing space. And that was when I you know, was building websites and then Google launched AdWords and suddenly then there was Google Analytics um, or, or, or Urchin at the time, um, which just opened my eyes to the fact that you can measure everything which happens on the web. You had suddenly had this ability to actually see everything which is happening on your website. Before that, you had like server-side tracking so you could get hits to the server and how many times people were accessing a file. But Google Analytics was really the first time which opened my eyes to the fact that, wow, you can see everything which is happening on your site. And then with UTM um, parameters and then being able to use um, then being able to use um, uh, AdWords as well, being able to link all of those things. So you can see really clearly what is the impact of my online marketing efforts on my website, on my website traffic, and then being able to see what people are doing on the site as well. Um, so that was kind of like my first, you know, I, that's when I kind of, I guess I lost my virginity to data. Um, and I, it just blew my mind about everything which you could do with data and how you can measure everything. And it was around that time where I made the decision that I was going to become a digital marketer. The digital marketing was my calling because suddenly I was able to, you know, and I could say with confidence that, if I did this, it was going to be deliver. If I did X, it's going to deliver Y. And before that, marketers didn't really have that, you know. And there was this whole perception of marketing, and still precise to this day, of being the coloring in department, you know, where you know marketing just makes things look pretty. I actually remember speaking with someone not long ago about this, and it's a very outdated way of thinking about it. That you know, marketers are just there to spend the money. Yeah, there's there's no real hard financials to it. And I'm going back about twenty or so years now. So now being able to change that narrative and go like, actually, do you know what? As a marketer, I can tell you that if we invest in this or if we send this email, this is the dollar value return from that. Um, so that was my first moment where I realized how data could be really important. And from then I kind of made it my mission to like, okay, well, how do I, how do I prove this? How do I make sure that this is something which is, becomes a hallmark of my career? So from there, moving into, into various marketing roles, it kind of all leveled back to that. If, you know, being able to provide that demonstrable, um, you know, demonstrably show that the marketing efforts, which I was which I was doing was able to have an impact. So whether it was at the University of Adelaide, being able to say that we're running AdWords campaigns, AdWords, well, um, Google Ads now well, was AdWords. AdWords campaigns are leading to someone searching for, I want to study biology, and then going to the University of Adelaide website and then being able to track that they then submitted a, an inquiry form, which then led to them going into the student database, attending open day, and then eventually enrolling. We could suddenly tie that all together. So no matter which organization you're in, you were able to do that. Um, and, I, and I got a, such a thrill. This is going back to like mid, like 2007, I think, you know, when I was able to go into an organization, like a Bluestone organization, like um, uh, like Sandstone organization, like the University of Adelaide and bring that level of thinking in there, bring that level of thinking about, you can measure everything as well, you know? And then it became like, how do we measure everything? How do we make sure everything can be attributed back to, you know, to all our marketing efforts? Then Facebook ads came along, um, Look, so without kind of going into every single part of the journey, in a way, then we also then started to make a bit of a rod for our own back into, as digital marketers, um, as my friend Jason Neve likes to say. And part of that is the fact that, you know, because we said we could measure everything, suddenly everyone wanted to see the attribution of every single thing in marketing. You know, it's like, you know, what's the ROI in this? What's the ROI in that? What's the ROAS? Yeah. And then, then we kind of went through this really funny period after this initial awakening of everyone just demanding that we see ROAS, 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 ROAS. We're not going to invest yeah. it. We're not going to invest in it until we can see the ROAS. And it always seemed a little bit funny to me, you know, as a, as, as a marketer, as a performance marketer, that in particular, when you looked at all these different brands and they had their different attribution models, like Google's attribution model, I can get because people search for something. It's very intent based. They search for it. They're probably going to buy it straight away. Yeah, so yeah. that makes a lot of sense to be able to kind of see that. It's a very bottom of the funnel, high intent sort of behavior. But then you've got something like Facebook ads or, or social or digital ads or YouTube, YouTube advertising or anything like that, where we were still trying to use this idea about, okay, it's got like a, a seven-day click or a 14-day click or a 28-day click. People are going to convert within that window. And if they don't, it doesn't work. So why do we do that? And I never quite understood that. You know, about why people wanted to wanted to say that, that, well, you know, if it's not delivering me X number of ROAS, I'm going to cut it because it means it doesn't work. Because I reflected on my own behavior as a consumer and my, and my behavior wasn't, well, I saw this ad, then I clicked on it. And then after I clicked on it, I then went to Google and then searched for that brand. And then I came and bought. My journey was, I saw that ad, I clicked on it, then I forgot about it. Then I went away and did something else. Then I saw someone wearing it. So I went back on the website, then I searched for the brand and then I bought it. Yep. Yeah, It's much messier than we think. 
But for some reason, human beings, we want to think that everything is really linear. We think that there's, that there's really clear conversion path. And then people were talking about, well, what's the value of a Facebook customer versus a Google customer versus an email customer? And they were like, oh, my God, email, email, like our email customers are worth more to us than our Facebook customers. Let's stop doing Facebook ads and put everything into email because email's got the best ROI. And I was like, but how do you think they got on our email list in the first place? Yep. That's true. So a lot of these things kind of led me to like, like how we're we thinking about this wrong because we're not looking at the data the right way. We were looking at things with this direct attribution, like you do this and then this happens, but that's not the case at all. Um, which kind of led me to, to you know, when I was at Uber, um, then I went to Uber and Uber, everyone was expected to be an analyst. Um, I, I learned uh, I, I learned SQL at, at Uber primarily because like you had to, like you were given like when you joined Uber at the time, we were very small. We were like a thousand people or so. It was literally, here's a SQL database, go for your life, write your own queries, figure out your data. And it's like, and, and if you can't figure it out, then you're probably not going to have a job here for long. So I had to learn SQL. I had to learn SQL like everyone else at Uber um, and started pulling out the data. But then it prompted me to ask more questions, you know, and to look at data a different way. Because a lot of our activity at Uber, yes, it was online, but it was also a lot of offline stuff as well. So we need to be able to measure the impact. Like when we do this, what happens? When we offer certain incentives, what happens? to measure all those different things. And I needed to be able to pull out the data. And that led to my second data awakening of realizing that it's more than just, you know, of, of, of looking at how do we actually tie all this together? How do we like query across different tables, different databases? And the same thing applied to, to, to marketing in general, that it's not just about those platforms in isolation. You kind of need to bring everything back to, you need to look at everything through the same lens. Yeah, and that's really the only yep. way which data works. And then when I left Uber, which we had so so much access to to all this data, these amazing dashboards, which the which the engineering team there built, to then go to um to then go back to you know um the brand side, um sorry to e-commerce side, working at Rideaway, thinking, well, how do I bring in that same level of thinking? How do I get that same visibility? Oh, sorry, I worked in another place called My Budget before that, um, which then let me think, well, how do we actually pull in all this data from different places rather than trying to look at everything from a direct attribution point of view of like, you do this, you do X, Y happens. I needed yeah. a way to be able to pull in all the data across everything which we were doing from call center data to website data to our ads data, email and pull everything into one or figure out a way where I can get it into the one place where I could then actually get a proper holistic view of everything. Because back then in 2008, 18, that was when I was starting to realize that the way which we look at attribution is fundamentally flawed by thinking that there is this, you know, direct line from this happens and then you know, X happens and then Y happens. So then thinking, how do I bring it all together? Which led me to Supermetrics and then discovering after like searching the internet for a long time, stumbling across Supermetrics. I'm pretty sure, um, Mikhail, is it? The the founder? The old Mikhail, yeah. I believe that he was actually the person I was dealing with at the time. I like, believe so. In yeah, the, it was, this, yeah, I believe it so. was tiny. Like Supermetrics was a tiny organization. And I remember having calls with this person in Finland to talk about what I wanted to do, you know, um, and I was like, this is amazing. It didn't do everything, but it did a lot of things. So I was like, great, we need to invest in this tool and brought it in. And it just changed my life, you know, as a marketer. And it gave us so, my marketing team, so much visibility, you know, around what was happening across the entire organization and what the impact of our efforts were, you know, as well on different metrics. We were able to see that, you know, when we published this blog or we sent this email, this is the impact it has on not just traffic, but also telephone leads, you know, into, into the business as well. And, and able to kind of pull all that data together um, and then look at it in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, so that, that that's kind of like you know, what brought me to Supermetrics and how I realized that and this is kind of like the way we need to go. And we really appreciate you kind of sharing that journey, right? Um, I, I think really, you know, just I feel like you've really answered most of the questions that some of our audience have asked. <laughs> they ask things like, hey, are you under the impression that attribution is going out the door and you need to look at a more holistic view. Yes, you answered yep. that as well. That's correct. Um, I think also, you know, some people, some people say, hey, ROAS is, is such a silly paradigm for marketers. Like we shouldn't just look at ROAS alone. There's other things. So yeah, exactly right. But I want to really start to dive into the AI side of things, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you talk about analyzing all these different sets of data from different places. But I remember during our conversation, you also mentioned a lot about how you can use AI to potentially mm -hmm. do a large majority of the analyzing work for you. 
But why not give us an example, right? Because on the slide right now, we are sharing a concrete example of what you typically see on your day-to-day -day work. Maybe you could start by explaining that first, how you would do the analyzation on a human level first, and how do you then use AI to potentially <laughs> maybe in the future replace that? Yeah, so maybe you can share a little bit more about that before you go. Yeah. To Look, the, the last few months, um, obviously ChatGPT has been all the rage for the last six, seven months. Um, I've been really playing with it as a data analysis tool. First of all, in, in initially just copy and pasting data sets into ChatGPT. Um, but now ChatGPT has the advanced data analysis plugin, um, which if you're a pro user, you can access. Um, this allows you to actually upload multiple different data sets into ChatGPT and ask it to analyze it. Um, if you explain to it how you want it to act as, what the data sets mean, it'll do the analysis for you. What you're looking at here on the screen is looking at a lagged analysis of the correlation between different channels. Um, so between different channels to look at um, uh, which channels correlate best to direct traffic in this case. Um, in this piece of work, what I, did, what I wanted to know was Direct traffic is the biggest revenue driver of this particular website, of this particular brand. Um, but, I, but direct traffic doesn't happen in isolation. Also, you don't really know where direct traffic happens from. So what I wanted to do was understand, well, what are the drivers to direct traffic? Um, and then after that, looking at, is there a correlation between direct traffic? And, so, and then is there a lagged effect between that? What has the most immediate impact on direct traffic versus what has a little bit of lag behind it as well, which sometimes take a little, takes a little bit of time um, before we see the impact of it. So how I would normally have done this is, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have done it um, because it's it's a lot of data to go through. Um, you're looking at a lot of correlations um, between, uh, it's you, you need to, in Google Sheets, I would be exporting this from Google Analytics um, or using Supermetrics to pull down a query of traffic sources and sessions by day, for instance, and then manually running correlation analysis um, over um, between direct and every other, um, uh, so doing regression analysis between um, uh, direct traffic and each one of these channels in isolation. It would have been like, you know, let's say there were 20, 30 different traffic sources, I would have done this 20 or 30 times. So it would have taken me quite a while to do. But the difference is that what, what I then added to this was a lagged effect to be able to look at, okay, is there actually a lagged relationship between direct, direct traffic and any one of these other traffic sources? Again, to see, what would move the needle the most? Like which area would we, if we invested more money into this, could we expect to see the most immediate impact on revenue? Yep. So in this particular example, what this shows is all those different channels and also the correlation um, between direct traffic and paid social, Google traffic, Instagram, um, paid social, organic organic search and, and, and Facebook paid traffic, which is the same as the, as the first one, um, but just labeled differently. The, the reasoning behind the, what this showed me from looking from being able to do this type of analysis is that <clears throat> paid so this Facebook paid social channel, which is a specific campaign which we're running um, in paid social, has a really strong correlation to direct traffic. Has the most, but also has the most immediate correlation to direct traffic as well, which shows that when we run this sort of campaign and we increase the budget of it, we're immediately driving direct traffic. Um, the step before this was looking at direct traffic having the closest correlation to revenue and actually had a very strong correlation to revenue. So looking at this, I can now say with, with, with some degree of certainty that direct traffic, so that if I increase the budget on paid social, I will most likely be that I've got a pretty strong chance I'm going to be able to drive additional revenue, um, you know, additional direct traffic and then additional revenue as well. Mm. The lag part comes in because on the bottom camp, um, the bottom table uh, chart there is that this is a Facebook paid campaign, which is actually running more towards the middle and bottom of the funnel. So this is specifically running at a specific stage in the funnel, um, mainly because we didn't bother changing the UTMs from when we set up this campaign. But I can see that there's a lagged effect on that. So this tells me, this gives me the additional data point that there's a 10 day lag between when this when this campaign starts to impact direct traffic, which then shows me that I've got my top of funnel campaign, which is that first chart, having an immediate effect, which is what I wanted to do. But then it takes about 10 days for the impact of my retargeting, my middle and bottom of the funnel campaigns to then bring people back to come and purchase. So I know in this example that my purchase cycle is about 10 days for when people first get exposed to an ad at the top of funnel level to when they come back. 
And you could do the right. same analysis as well, looking at your using your campaign UTMs as well to look at, okay, well, could you do this and 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 compare different types of campaigns? Um, you know, if you've got different products, the different products have a different effect on it as well. But all this data could only be used by uploading these data sets to ChatGPT um, using the advanced data analysis model, uploading it in there and training it about how to think about the data, training it on exactly what the data means, training it on what type of analysis I want it to do. ChatGPT can recommend some stuff around what sort of analysis it thinks you can do. But the best way to do it, I found, was to actually go into with what are the questions I'm trying to answer? You know, what questions do I need answered and how can the machine, how can the AI help me get closer to finding an answer for that? And in this case, I was looking at marketing investment. If I'm looking at budget allocation between Facebook, Google, Instagram, um, Twitter, whatever, which one should I, which one, if we're looking to drive immediate revenue, do I need to make sure I'm dialing up? You know, versus which ones don't quite the same have, don't have quite as strong a relationship with, 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 with daily revenue. Yeah. And, and would you say that, so, I mean, one of the questions in the chat was, hey, can you say the name of the plugin of ChatGPT for data analysis? I assume, like you said, this is just ChatGPT Pro, right? That yep. there is, right? Yeah, it's it's the but, advanced data analysis. Um, so you need to be on Pro. Um, if you create a new chat and you hover over the ChatGPT4, um, the dropdown, which says plugins, uh, the dropdown, there should be an advanced data analysis. If you don't have it in there, go to your settings and then enable beta features. Mm. Yeah, and of course, uh, for those of you who may not, uh, who may still be unsure where to go, we have the contact information on Mar after this. Drop in an email, drop in a LinkedIn message. She'll be more than happy to help you. Yeah, hit, hit me up on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd be more than happy. I'll, I'll try to upload a video actually. Um, for anyone who doesn't know where to where to find it, um, just follow me on LinkedIn, and I'll uh, I'll share that video later today. That's nice. And and Mar, I'm just really curious, right? So particularly for this part, you mentioned so when you are right now trying to train the model. It seems like, you know, instead of typing a, a prompt saying that, hey, tell me what are the strategies I should use based on this data. It seems like you're not doing that today. You're giving it more like, hey, I want specifically tell me, um, you won't even ask JB to give you a summary because from my experience, you have to give it quite concrete prompts to say that, hey, tell me X, Y, Z. And from there, you make your own analysis. Am I right to say that that's currently how you're using ChatGPT together with data sets today? Um, I'm actually getting it to 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 make recommendations as well and ask and, and, and telling me what the trends are. Yeah, you know, what are you seeing in the data? So, but but being very specific around it. Um, it has a tendency to give you just very generalized data, like this is doing that, that's doing like this is doing X, this is doing Y. Um, what ChatGPT doesn't do doesn't do very well is understanding anomalies. So, like for instance, sale periods, right? It'll look at a sale period or look when a product goes on sale, um, and that's in one of the examples later. And it'll go like, well, that's one of your best-selling products. And so if you look at the data at face value, yep, sure, it's one of the best-selling products. But you need to train it on the fact that when the gradient goes from you know, 0.8 to 1.5, if the, gra the gradient of the slope is greater than one, for instance, it means it's gone on sale. So disregard that as being a top product. But again, you could actually counter that by actually uploading additional data points. You can actually upload, like for, for instance, um, your gross margin on each one of those products, you know, by day. So when gross margin for this product goes from being 70% to 40%, it's probably gone on sale. So, so it's that continual education and refinement. A lot of this analysis, if I were to do it myself, and I have done some of this myself, is that you'd create it once in Google Sheets, realize you made a mistake, and then you'd have to start over from scratch again. Yeah, and then the, and then so some of this would take like half a day or days, days even to do. But with ChatGPT, when you make a mistake, you're just telling it, just retraining it. Actually, I made a mistake with this data. You know, here's the corrected data. A lot of this is that you know while. There's also the GIGO principle, you know, garbage in, garbage out. A lot of what you need to do as the user on ChatGPT is to really think about what's the data you're inputting into it. Yeah, as well, making sure you're really clear about what data points, what data point you're you're uploading to ChatGPT, um, and then training it with what each one of those columns mean, what each one of those fields are. Um, and that's really important so that it understands the context of the data. Um, it's it's reasonably good at getting things straight away. Like I, I've uploaded data sets to before and straight away it says, okay, you're giving me this, 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 and this. You're telling me that this is website data. You're telling me that this is your Facebook advertising spend. Um, and then, and then, 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 then inferring from that what analysis you wanted to do. And I usually like to actually be pretty clear about what it is. 
you know, that this is what the data is. This is what I want you to do with it. Sometimes we'll even go into the depth of actually explaining what each column is just to make sure that it truly mm -hmm. understands it. Um, you can even get asked ChatGPT to just tell you, like, is this, like, tell me what you think this means. Um, so in the case of like the, 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 gross, the gross margin example, that's something which I actually asked told explain to chat gpt like, this is actually the gross margin on each one of these products by day wow, okay. yeah so it's like this is a gross margin when when gross margin becomes this then do this you yeah, know then ignore this data you know or assume that it's gone on sale um or when you see consecutive days of zero sales assume that it's gone out of stock so that way it doesn't give you false positives because it doesn't know what you know it doesn't know that something's gone out of stock it'll instead say this product stops selling on a certain day you know go investigate why but I know why. So I'll tell it, okay, well, that means it's out of stock. So it will actually change its response and tell you that this this went out, of, you know, this was selling really well, but then it went out of stock on this date. So recommendation, buy more of that product. Yeah. It, so, and yeah. I, yeah. And I'll be upfront about this. I, I feel like, because you are definitely very experienced, but I can already see we have questions like, can you share your prompts? <laughs> can you share any specific <laughs> examples? Like how you do it? You know, it, would it be, would it be, I, I guess, would that be something you're going to do as a video or something? Just, just show people an example, you know? Yeah, why not? Why not? I'll, 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 I'll have to, I'll make some time for it. I'll make some time and just like put together a blog just with, um, just some prompts and some ideas to, to get marketers started with, with this. Cause I think it, a lot of it can unlock a hell of a lot of potential. Um, yeah. If I look at it purely from, you know, obviously um, the agency, um, Ecom Nation, you know, we are, we, we are all about, you know, e-commerce growth and performance media being a big part of what we do. Being able to look at all your different campaigns, you know, look at different campaigns, creative, and do creative analysis, um, really deep creative analysis, not just by looking at Facebook data and Facebook data telling you what have people done, um, like, you know, what actually happened with the ad, like how many, what's the click-through rate, um, you know, what's the cost per click, all that data. But imagine being able to take that out and look at, okay, if you've got your ads labeled correctly between like which stage of the funnel, the type of campaign it is, um, what the objective of, the, of, of it was, then pulling that data into your, then taking your Google Analytics data about the behavior of people who had a first session, your GA4 data, whose first session included that visit, um, included a visit using one of those, clicking on one of those ads and looking at the correlation there. So taking the data to the next step and looking at it outside the silo and looking at it outside that silo of Facebook ads and pulling it into and taking the GA4 using Supermetrics, pulling into your Google sheet. Mm -hmm. And being able to, you know, and pulling into Google Sheet, getting it all there, and then exporting that, loading it into ChatGPT, and letting ChatGPT do that analysis for you to figure out what's the correlation between different types of creative and website behavior. Yeah, you know, which 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 um uh, which creative led to the most engaged users on your website? Yeah, and I mean, speaking of creative and and all that, it, we are right right now very much focused on AI and how you can use it to analyze data. But I think since we're come, you know, we want to get to the questions and answers because I want to make sure you have time to answer them. But I'm just really curious, you know, as a last part, right? You know, we talk about generative AI and data, but what other areas in terms of a marketer's life have you used generative AI for as well? And I guess before you answer that, Mal, I, I think we can actually have a poll. We, we of course, want to also kind of understand for our audience here today, how many of them are using some sort of generative AI, either chat GPT or, you know, mid journey or something like that. Yeah, I, I guess we can get a poll, but I'll pass the mic to you, Ma, you know, tell, tell us more about other use cases or maybe other use cases in certain industries that you've seen work really well when it comes to generative AI. It's it's a it's a, it's a marketers marketers on the call, so I'm going to stick to, to marketing. Um, look, uh, copywriting is 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 a is a, is a pretty pretty easy one. So in terms of being able to train up ChatGPT with your tone of voice, your brand foundations, all those things, and then to be able to spit up pretty good copy, if you actually upload enough samples of examples of copy, which is you know, on brand, it'll actually learn that pretty well. Um, so I, I've been using a lot for copywriting and really encouraging a lot of people to use it for copywriting. Um, just being able to start an initial idea as well in terms of doing things like, um, you know, plan me a, a, a 12 month email calendar for, um, you know, for, for this particular type of customer about how do I engage them after they, after they make their first purchase and how do I push them to a second purchase? It can start with that initial idea generation. I would highly recommend don't do things verbatim. I can spot someone who's taken chat GPT copy and copy and pasted it because it, it just has a look to it. <laughs> you just know that it's written by AI. 
but take it as a starting point. And that's where a lot of this is to use AI as a starting point. Um, I use Midjourney a lot as well, just in terms of like creative ideas. Like if there's something in my mind about how I want something to look and I want to share it with the creative team or the client, I'll use Midjourney and prompt Midjourney um, to, to, to come up with something, to come up with, you know, an aesthetic or a look and then give that to the client to say, we need something which looks like this. Um, so that's been, that's been great as well. Um, but also combining them as well. So combining chat GPT to actually create the mid journey prompt. So I actually have um, one of my chats uh, is actually trained with mid journey. So I've actually trained it how to use mid journey, um, trained it with the particular mid journey style, which I like in terms of like all the variations you can do. So I can just take that and copy and paste it. I, I just add whatever inputs I want. I'm, I'm pretty much just filling in the blanks. Um, right now when I use that one. So that's been pretty powerful to be able to spit, spit out ideas pretty quickly. Um, there's another couple as well, which, I'm, uh, which, which I've been playing around with. There's, um, um, there's AI video, um, video ads, um, where again, you just upload your assets. You tell it like the, the mood, the music, and it'll just come up with something, which is, which is pretty good. You upload your own assets and it'll, it'll, it'll do stuff like that. Um, there's AI logo makers. There's AI um, uh, user interfaces. Um, UIZard uh, is one which I've been using a little bit where you can actually just upload any website you want. You just paste in the URL um, and then you tell it, based on this URL, design me a website which looks like blah, and it'll come up with, here's a UI. Here's yeah. the UI. And again, it's not it's not 100%, but it's maybe 67, 70%. It helps you get started with ideas, which then someone who actually knows what the hell they're doing can then take and actually um, finalize and finish. And, and I think, Ma, as you're saying all this, we, we, we really need, we probably need two things for you. Number one, our audience is asking for prompts. Hey, give us some prompts, example. <laughs> like, no, number two, you, I mean, you mentioned ChatGPT, Meet Journey, you mentioned a couple of other tools. I've got a LinkedIn idea for you. Just do a post listicle, list down your top five or top 10 and say- That's a great idea. Use it for. That That's a great amazing. idea. Like people yeah. following you, they'll love it. Because as you're saying all this, I've even looked at uh, um, you know, applications before where you take a product of, you, you take a picture of a product, can be a massive background. You put it into um, the tool and you just generate a beautiful background from there. So mm. it, sometimes it can be just as simple things like this, simple use cases. The data site definitely needs some learning. But I think really what Mao and us discussed before this is at the end of the day, if we can even encourage the, let's say, 30% of you who have not used any sort of generative AI just to get started with something. That's, that's really the end of uh, the goal of our webinar, right? Yeah, uh, that's what I really focus. I probably recommend just focusing on, on, a, on a few things as well. Like there's new AI tools all the time. I get emails about them all the time. But you just want to get good at a few. Like get really good at a few rather than like spreading yourself too thin across too many. That's probably the best advice I can give you if you're looking to get into this space. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, so it's not just fully rely on AI. The human can work together with AI to do things better. You know, like you said, just generating an idea from mid journey or something, get through that. And then you mm -hmm. can get to more advanced things in the future, I would say. Yeah. Now we just want to actually go into the questions right now. Uh, but before that, you know, we spoke a lot about, you know, generative AI and data. Um, if we can have some time to actually just give a quick walkthrough on how even Supermetrics today, you know, in our company, we are really like to experiment with new things, right? So we're also trying to blend data together with, uh, you know, what we call uh, chat GPT or generative AI. So I just want to take maybe about three to five minutes just to show that everybody here, you know, some of the new chat GPT integration that we have. And for our customers, this is live today. You should just give it a shot because we would like to get feedback as well. So let me just share my screen really quickly to everyone here. And Mao, you are a customer. You can use this as well uh, when you're testing us out. Great. So I just want to show everybody really quickly. For those of you who are a customer, you will know that this is one of our super metrics for GA4 template. All our templates are free. You can literally get them right now on our website. This could be templates for a start for you. Now, we essentially help marketers to generate these dashboards, right? These different elements over here. How we do it is by bringing the raw data into places like Google Sheet. Now, for those of you who use us, you will see that we are ref this will be very familiar to you, a set of raw data. And on the right side, you have the Zoometric sidebar where you can simply download us through an extension today. Even for those of you who are not customer, get on a free trial, give it a try. Now, the really cool thing is that we've added this thing called Add Results Summary by ChatGPT. And let's say if I were to just apply the changes. And in just a couple of seconds, depending on the volume of data set, ChatGPT literally would take your data and give you a summary just by looking at this data set. 
It could be messy at the very beginning, but let ChatGPT do the work for you and just give you a good idea of what you are looking at today. So we just give it some time for it to run and you'll be seeing the data uh, in a few moments time. Okay, so if I were to make this slightly bigger, if I were to merge this, yep, and let's make this slightly bigger. You'll see that ChatGPT has given me a pretty good, uh, you know, just a quick summary. You know, it may not be something that I can act on straight away, but imagine if you're in an agency, you can pretty much give this to your client and or you can use this as a starting point for those. Mm. And of course, we know that APEC is a place of region of many countries, many languages. Great thing is we have it in Thai, for example. This is an example in Thai. As you can see, even the metrics and dimensions are in Thai. This is one in Bahasa, Indonesia. You know, we have it, it's the same kind, it's the same ChatGPT summary. We simply just change the reporting language. And even for, I, I saw someone was from Taiwan earlier on. So Mandarin Chinese, this is also available today as well. Now, of course, the second question that many people will ask us is, great, you know, so much is gets the summary for us, the integration in ChatGPT. Can we do a custom prompt? And this is the last part that I want to show everybody. Yes, you can do a custom prompt. And I'll start this by actually just getting the query to run first. So let's imagine right now we have Facebook data. We Let's do a custom prompt. I want all of all my campaign data. I want to know what are the campaigns with the lowest and highest cost per website conversion and include their cost per thousand impression and cost per click. And multi is an example where I'm trying to be really specific. I don't use words like CPM, CPC. I'm just trying to tell uh, ChatGPT really specific things on what I want and they will get it to me. So again, I ran a query earlier on before we started to save time. But as you can see, it has literally given me what I want exactly based on the custom prompt. And how we do it is simply just using our advanced setting, putting the customized prompt over here. And the, you can use a custom prompt just to get a summary of your data. Now, of course, uh, this is only available for Google Sheets today, so give it a try. Uh, very soon, we'll be implementing it for our other applications like Lucas Studio. So imagine you can use some of these templates that we have with a ChatGPT summary at the top, uh, things like that. So yeah, that was just a really quick um, sharing of what we have here at Metrix. We really want everybody just give it a try. Because again, we have a 14-day free trial. So give it a shot and tell us your feedback as well. Now, with that being said, Mao, back to you, because we've got a couple of questions that we have for you. Um, and let me just see what will be good. I think we have one question so far. Maybe I'll just start from this because this is more general. Now, are there any specific industries or sectors where you see that generative AI has shown uh, promising results in terms of marketing efforts? I can really only speak to e-commerce um, because that's, that's like all I do. Um, and in e-commerce, yes, definitely. Um, like we really start to see that as well. Um, there's some recent work which I did, which looked at, um, which again looked at some changes, uh, the, the effect of, of of Facebook ads on 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 other metrics, um, and you can see that there was a clear in the last 30, 60 days, the effect has been changing, um, and part of that has then led to, uh, yeah, the the one before, two two slides before that, um, was was looking at um, uh, the impact between, uh, but it's led to to the, us then reinvesting. As well, so I think if you're looking at anything in advertising, like anything like advertising emails or anything like that, you you can absolutely use generative AI from a data analysis point of view to um to to, to marry it up with with whatever your 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 website data is or things like that um to look at what the correlations are. But I think you know for me from an e-commerce perspective, like it, it's already kind of taking over the game. Like Shopify um has 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 implemented AI already um through Shopify Magic, which is just making it easier for for founders. Um, and brands to be able to do a lot of the 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 heavy lifting, um, which they would uh, you know, which they would ordinarily do, but getting an AI to do it instead. Um, so, uh, yeah, for me, I think e-commerce because that's that's the industry which I know know the best. Yeah, and that's a good answer as well. You know, um, and and in addition to that, right? Um, again, since we are kind of in generative AI and data again, there's this one question that was really interesting, which I think is really relevant because we all know that. Um, you know, Google is trying to take away, you know, the end of cookies and all that. So there's this whole question from Jim actually about third party attribution, third party data versus first party. I'm just going to ask a generic question, right? You know, knowing that the changes in the industry taking place, could generative AI even play a part in, I guess, better analyzing those two sets of data, first party, third party? What do you think? It's quite a generic question there, but I'd love to get your thoughts. 
Yeah, well, my thoughts on that is that you know, it, it kind of means that it doesn't really matter whether it's first party or third party um, because it, it allows you in a way to do media mix modeling. Um, you know, like, like you know, I guess a, a more simplified version of, of media mix modeling by doing like just con- a whole lot of regression analysis um, across fairly large data sets across multiple channels by just putting all the data in there. So stuff which would normally have taken you know months to do or, or you know so days or weeks to do um, means that you can do a version of media mix modeling, which means that you don't really need to worry about what the attribution is. If you just look at each one of those data sets, more or less in isolation. Um, you like if, if you are then looking at um, but then pulling that all into you know pulling that all into chat GPT to look at it, what the, what's the correlation between all of it. Um, so I'm just reading the question for myself now. There's a couple of questions there. I mean, if, if any of them jumps up to you, feel free to answer them as well. Yeah, yeah I was just trying to find the actual the, the 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 one about about the one about first party. Look, first party data, yes, like absolutely. Like you, you need to have a first party data strategy. You need to be pulling that all in. But even then, when you look at something like using that first party data in in third party platforms, like trying to use first party data in 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 Facebook ads, for instance, um, the matching quality is now so poor. And Facebook are quite open about it as well, saying that yes, you can upload like your your retargeting list, but really you're probably going to only match like fifty percent of them if you're lucky. Right, and and I've I've heard that directly from Facebook about the problem there that you know that that the matching is really poor because people are opting out of it, and that's perfectly fine. But using first party data for yourself to inform your own marketing efforts in terms of how are you using it to 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 change the types of campaigns you're running, um, to 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 change you know uh to to do to to inform your strategy, you should absolutely be doing that, and you should always have been doing that to to be capturing first party data, not for retargeting someone, but capture first party data so you can learn more about your customers. Yeah. And, and I mean, speaking of first party and third party, we, we know the whole idea why, you know, uh, people are going more towards, you know, like I said, uh, third party is because of this whole privacy um, issue, right? In fact, our latest two question was, you know, how do you navigate concerns around data that are, let's just say, sensitive in nature? Or let's say for you, who's running an agency, working with different clients, mm-hmm. are your clients even open to the idea of you uploading their sales data to chat GPT, things, things like that. You know, what has your experience been like, especially when, again, let's say your agency, you want to introduce chat GPT to your client yep. or chat GPT to your higher management if you are a brand. How would you go about that? What's your experience like? Yeah, great question. Um, around privacy, uh, I don't upload anything which can be identified. Um, everything which I upload is just de-anonymized data even to the you know in this there may be product names but i always make sure that there's no that there's no brand name in there so it can't actually be related back to um uh related back to a particular client um or a particular brand Mm, right and how would you and generally do you think people or or companies you work with are generally open to that or is that something that you sometimes have to sign i don't know an nda or something like that generally everyone's open to it Everyone's open to it if it's going to help you do analysis faster and help you get to a result um, faster. Yeah, that's yeah that that's that's generally been my my experience with uh, with all the customers, all my clients who I've spoken to about generative AI and ChatGPT and using it for analysis. Um, they're all open to it, um, but obviously with the caveat that nothing identifiable gets gets uploaded there. So it is all it, it for all intents and purposes it is just generic data. Understood. And I guess coming to the last question, right? And again, I, I'm really apologize if you can't answer all the questions. Again, we have the contact information of Mao or Supermetrics. Feel free to reach out to us, connect with us and ask questions because again, a webinar is hard for us to, to answer all things. But sounds like it's something we should do again, Mao, in the, in the future. And, and yeah, absolutely. We'd love to. Time where things go. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, at least to end off on a nice note. So we have so many marketers, so many aspiring people who want to do better at their job today. You know, that's the reason why they're on the webinar. In your own words, what is one last message you will leave to them in terms of how they should approach their career, how they should even get started on advanced marketing strategies? Because you definitely had your journey, but what would you say is that last piece of message you will leave to all of them here as a personal career advice? Always be open to learning. Um, never stop learning. Um, always be curious. Yeah. That's the best uh, that's, that's that's just be curious. Amazing, amazing. So, I mean, Mao, I'll, I'll give you some time, I guess, to, to just share a little bit more about yourself, right, in terms of where people can find you. Of course, we spoke about LinkedIn, but mm-hmm. is there anything else that you would like to share from, from your end in terms of uh, how people should, if they want to engage with you, speak to your team, how, they should reach, how should they reach out to you? What's the best way to talk to you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can head to our website, ecomnation.com.au, um, book in a time if you're an e-commerce brand and want to talk strategy, um, talk about how we can help your brand. Um, otherwise, tune into the podcast this week in e-commerce. We're available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Apple Podcasts. Um, otherwise, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, always always up for a chat and uh, find out what's, what's happening in the world of marketing around the world. Yep. And Mao, I can always see a you know, follow you for just a little while, a bag ago, and yeah, you are very active. So great, great to have you on today. And of course, for those of you who are present here today, regardless you are a customer or not a customer today, uh, so Matrix would love to speak to you as well. You know, if you'd like to learn more about our AI capabilities or more about our product, or even just maybe you're a customer and you just want to find out more like, hey, what are the changes recently? What are the updates? You know, let us know in the poll because uh, we'll be more than happy to share more with you as well uh, in terms of what we have. But yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, it in terms of the webinar today. Seems like we are ending slightly earlier. You can see a few people dropping off already as well, probably getting back to work or lunch or something. Uh, but Mark, any last words from you uh, for our audience today? Um, one thing which I've been hearing a lot lately um, and I firmly believe is that AI isn't going to take your job. Someone who knows how to AI, use AI is going to take your job. So get stuck into it learn it um even just start experimenting now um and and start making it part of your toolkit uh, matter of fact in the uh in 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 the e-combination all hands on monday i introduced two new staff members one was actually a new staff member and then the other one was chat gpt like we've hired an assistant for everyone her name is chat gpt so you know please use her yep Some, someone in the comment just literally hashtag truth you know, <laughs> it resonates with the message that yes they will not take over our jobs. It, it's, it's a collaboration. It's a partnership, as we have mentioned uh, earlier mm -hmm. on. Now, uh, again, with that being said, uh, as we have mentioned, we have come to the end of the webinar. So firstly, of course, thank you so much, Mal, and our audience for joining us today. We hope you gained some great insights to help in your marketing journey, at least just to give you that boost to give all these new technologies a shot. Um, and also on the page that you're seeing now you can also follow the link in the QR code to book a time with one of our APEC team members maybe you may be speaking with me as well who knows um, but again for those of you who want to comment with Mao, his contact information can be seen on the screen as well QR code to uh, so Mao's contact information is there yeah if not I think with that being said thank you so much everybody we, we really appreciate your time we are coming to the top of the hour so yeah uh, Mao, say, say your last goodbye to our audience and I believe that will be the end of our webinar fantastic thanks for joining us everyone yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Asha. You've been a great host. No, you've been a great uh, person who, who presented as well. So really love the chat with you. All right. I think that's pretty much it, everybody. Seems like it's about time. Yeah, I, I guess it's the time we say goodbye. You know, it goodbye is. to everybody. And yeah, enjoy your lunch or any work that you may have. All right. Take care, everybody. See you soon.